Welcome into the Locked On Knicks podcast. A big win for the Knicks, but potentially a big loss. They knock off the heat, but Julius Randle suffers what appears to be a severe shoulder injury. We get into all the implications of that next on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. I want to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today. And every day we're now available on all platforms. So if you want to see our, our typically smiling today, frowning faces, uh, you can do so on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe and hit that notifications bell to ensure you never miss an episode. And then activate that auto download function on your podcast platform if you just don't like looking at us. But who's talking to you? I'm Gavin Shaw, your favorite play-by-play broadcaster's favorite play-by-play broadcaster. He is Alex Wolf, editor-in-chief of the Strickland the Greatest Knicks website in the whole wide world. You can check out all their work on all forms of social media at the strict.land. Alex, an incredible performance for the New York Knicks. Jalen Brunson torching the Miami Heat on national television. Quentin Grimes, Josh Hart, they were bullies burrowing their way to the rim over and over again. Josh Hart had a dunk of the year candidate. Quentin Grimes got to the line, I feel like, more times than he had the entire season before this game started. OG Ananobi was a menace. Precious Achua, maybe his best defensive game as a Nick. Everything was clicking. Everything was working. And then Julius Randle with four and a half minutes to go in this one uh, tripped up by Jaime Jaquez trying to take a charge down by 17, again, with four and a half minutes left. Um, tries to brace his fall with his right hand, separated shoulder. Um, we do not know the full extent of the injury beyond the fact that it is a dislocation. It did not look good. Uh, some of the reports coming out are not good. Um, I, I can imagine bad, but what was your initial reaction um, to watching the play and, and as we've gotten more information here? I mean, I hate seeing injuries ever so when he came up and you could see his shoulder was like a solid few inches lower than it should have been that was not great um <laughs> i closed my eyes for replays because i i can't stand watching that stuff over again um but yeah it was uh it was a bummer man i mean i so the only thing that's come out so far that we know for certain is that the x-ray was negative but that's a very small victory that basically just says he didn't break his collarbone but there's very little you can glean from an x-ray as far as, um, you know, cartilage related stuff, as far as tendon related stuff. Uh, you know, if, if his labrum is torn or something like that, that's not going to show up on an x-ray. So apparently he did go in for an MRI on Saturday night. That was there was some reporting out there. I think Woj had it and I think it was corroborated by Ian Begley that. Randall was going in for an MRI somewhere, I would assume, it's, uh, maybe hospital uh, for special surgery in New York since they were in New York. And that's like where the players usually go. Um, so he was getting it MRI'd and presumably he'll get a CAT scan and uh, maybe even ultrasound. Like they'll do everything to make sure that they know the severity of this. I don't know when we're going to learn the severity of it. All we know is that he's out for their next game for sure. Um, and beyond that, it's it's going to be rocky. But as a, you know, I hate ever trying to uh, project our own experiences onto like the professional athlete experience, because obviously he's going to get much better medical care than I get at my, you know, my local physician. But, but we do it anyways. But Go we ahead. do it anyway. I mean, I had I sustained a shoulder injury that had a, a small dislocation of my shoulder a couple years ago, and I never really got a straight answer because I didn't get insurance clearance to get an MRI because they were basically like, well, seems minor enough. Like if you have a minor tear of your labrum, then it can, it does sort of just heal itself with rest and whatever. And, and then, you know, gradual ramp up of exercise and strengthening the area and stuff like that again, which I've done. And now I feel perfectly healthy and I lift weights and play basketball and I don't feel any issues from it. Uh, but I did feel issues for, for like a year, um, you know, small or large. And it was, it was a, pain the butt especially when i first started playing basketball again and stuff like if your arm gets caught the wrong way it's kind of just like you you'll hear that little click or whatever and then you worry that something's going wrong again um as far as julius is concerned i mean just based off everything i've been reading i was trying to find the tweet there was a doctor like a, a sports medicine doctor that put out a long tweet about the injury 
and was basically like, look, in my professional opinion, just based off where his shoulder ended up, where his arm ended up and how clearly severely dislocated you could see it was, there's probably a better chance than not that he has at minimum like a partial, if not full tear of his labrum. But again, we'll, we'll see what ends up happening there. Best case scenario, they were able to pop it in and he can rehab it for a few weeks and come back. Uh, worst case scenario, you know, he's got to get surgery and he's probably out for the rest of the year. So whatever the option ends up being, it seems like the Knicks are probably going to be without him for a number of weeks, if not a month and change uh, regardless. So there's some short term and potentially long term planning for the rest of the season at play here. And pretty much no matter what it seems like. Yeah. And just, and just to break down like where the differentiation comes in, um, Brian Sutterer, who is a doctor, um, had this um, almost certainly tore his labrum. If the MRI shows a fracture or very extensive tear, tear, he'll have surgery and be done. If the MRI shows a mild tear, no fracture, then it's a discussion of trying to rehab and return in maybe three to five weeks versus having surgery in basketball will be more likely to return without surgery compared to football. If he tries to rehab but keeps having instability or pops out again, then he's probably having surgery and done for the year. So it's, it, I think that's the that's the tricky part here from a psychological perspective is that it's sort of all or nothing where the Knicks can absolutely survive a month without Julius Randle. And, and that sucks, but maybe they go, I don't know, five and five in that month instead of seven and three in that month. Like ultimately it doesn't really change things for them. Right. And then if he's out for the season, it changes everything. So that's, that's where my head sort of went immediately. Like, all right, like worst case scenario, what is the reaction from the Knicks. And I think as painful as it is, Alex, like I would sort of be of the opinion, like I don't want to give up major assets if Julius Randle is gone because this team that all of a sudden was showing a ceiling that I think even, even the greatest optimists after the OG Adenobi trade didn't see. And I think that ceiling is like an injury for the Celtics away from maybe winning the Eastern conference. And then who knows from there? Um, if Randall's gone, like that discussion is over. Like there isn't someone they're going to trade for this deadline that is going to change that trajectory. And maybe there's some merit in still going after someone like Malcolm Brogdon and improving your team this year and, and having him ready to go next year or, or really anyone. Like, I mean, all these discussions come down to like, I mean, how, what's the fit? And also can you, or will they be worth the equivalent of what you give up in a future mega star trade? Like it, it really is that simple. So if if that theory still holds, even if it's DeJounte Murray and you say like, Hey, I think he'll have just as much value to the Sixers as we give up for him, then it's fine. Then you can still go ahead and do that. But I'm not sacrificing any asset that I'm not fairly sure I'm going to be able to replicate in a star trade without Julius Randle, because ultimately like, I, I just think it's a long shot. They even get out of the first round without him. Yeah, I mean, because the crazy thing is, is that they could potentially find someone to maybe replicate his scoring. You know, they can maybe find someone in, in that category and be like, okay, well, we can at least get that back. But the playmaking for him, I think, has been the biggest thing lately. And he's he's like almost a one of one with how good of a playmaker he is out of his spot on the roster. Like the guys that he constantly gets lumped in with are like Giannis and Jokic, like as far as playmakers that play yeah. like the four or five position. And that's it. Like that's his entire company uh, for how well he does things, you know, initiating and especially lately drawing lots of respect from defenses and kicking it out to his teammates and creating all those opportunities for the, the great amount of shooting that the Knicks have now surrounded him and Brunson with, whether it's mm -hmm. to Brunson himself or to OG in the corner or to Grimes or to McBride. McBride's been playing so great lately, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a couple minutes from this game. But like, you know, they, it, they've they really relied heavily on what Julius Randle was giving them. And, you know, that's kind of part of why we've been saying that they need another creator regardless, you know, like whether it's a Brogdon or something like that. Um, I think they should still go after that player no matter what. Um, I think that the, the other thing that they should try to do now is just, I mean, maybe there's a world where even if he's out for the year, you can still at least make it to the second round again or something like this team has been playing really, really good. Uh, so if you get someone that you can just kind of plug in and then run like heart and that person and, you know, I don't know, OG at the four sometimes like try to get a little more creative. 
pull back a bit on this like weird insistence on trading Quentin Grimes and keep him around. So you have another versatile wing you can keep out there to let Josh Hart play the four more often and stuff like that. You know, maybe, maybe you still find a decent, you know, recipe for success and are able to make something happen, but it's a, no doubt. It's a huge, huge loss. And ironically, I, I don't think they can because of NBA rules, but like, if they were able to just basically do backsies with the Pacers for Obi Toppin right now, that would probably be ideal. Unfortunately, yeah. I don't think they could do it, but like that would be that would be a guy, like the caliber of guy that I would be looking at, mm-hmm. you know, as a short term solution. If you can make it happen for like a, a couple second round picks or something, maybe it's still worth trying to go after something this year. Yeah, I just where I come down on it is this was a team that was already bereft of advantage creation and if Brunson let's just say Brunson's like 45 percent of it for the Knicks Julius was probably 40 and the remaining guys on the roster are 15 and Brunson's still there and he's still amazing and maybe the rest of this current roster could give you another 10 and maybe you could trade for someone who could give you another 20 percent of that but you're just you're at a deficit and it's where losing Emmanuel quickly and RJ Barrett kill you and that that's not me saying the trade was stupid og ananobi is incredible but you lost some depth and when something like this happens like you're like we said it preseason alex like even with those two guys we said if anything happens to randall like that's probably the year and something happened to randall and and to your point i mean this game i think just drove home that he is passing the basketball better than ever and he's processing and making decisions quicker than ever like there was one play that stood out to me where he got deuce on a switch turned the corner drew three different guys from the heat and then hit deuce in the opposite corner for a three and deuce is awesome he's shooting like 44 percent from threes and against the the fourth string memphis grizzlies he can totally create his own shot and look great um in the playoffs against a set talented defense like We've seen it with Deuce. He's not doing much, but he can certainly, like if Julius Randle is going to draw three guys, which Julius can do because he, I mean, there's a reason to your point. Like he, he's in that 20, 10 and five club with Jokic and Giannis. Like he's too big, he's too fast. And now I think his, his basketball brain has caught up with his physical talent and you're seeing someone, I, I think peak as a player before our eyes and, and to what extent it translated to the playoffs like that still has to be proven and 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 hopefully not I, I almost used past tense there, hopefully not had to be proven. Um, but the way he's playing this year, like I'm I'm more confident than ever that he can put together a good postseason if healthy. Um, but we, we might not get the chance to see it. And that would be heartbreaking because the Knicks um with this win, a, a decimation of a heat team that we should say was desperate coming in losing five straight. Um, they they look legit. Like I I don't know, you could ask me, does that mean like title contender legit like that's a different conversation but they look legit and and that's what makes us so sad yeah and we're gonna talk more about the randall situation obviously how to how to approach things going forward uh what the next steps might be for the knicks and then talk about this game a bit because it was truly an awesome game it's it's (laughs) unfortunate that it's getting really lost behind the fact that the knicks might have just lost one of their uh, best players. But Gavin, before we get into that, I want to let everyone know about our good friends over at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. And with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guarantee fit. Only available to U.S. customers. And Alex, we waited until Sunday night for a reason. Yes, it was partially so we could find out more about Julius Randle's injury, but it was also because it's now Super Bowl Sunday. Happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch 
grabbing your favorite football snacks and placing some super bets. So because we're recording this right after the NFC Championship game, the only one that's out there right now is the line. The 49ers are one and a half point favorites. I am taking the 49ers. This one, call me crazy. All you want for betting against Patrick Mahomes. But I, I just think the difference between their skill position talent and the Ravens skill position talent will put some points up on the board. FanDuel has found so many ways to end your season with a W or two or three. Not only can you bet on who wins Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. All righty, uh, we are back to the bad place. Julius Randle injured. What do the Knicks do? Um, and again, there's a chance he's just out for a month, and this is all an overreaction. But Alex, if he is out for longer, potentially the entire season, um, do you have a couple names you're you're kind of batting around your head early? Like, oh, could be this guy, could be this guy, could be this guy, to try and replicate a little bit of what Randall did just so this team doesn't completely fall apart. So I've been trying to find that sort of guy. And the trouble is, is that it's it's really hard like to oh. find the right price range. Because basically the Knicks, if they decide that they want to address the Julius Randall spot in the in the lineup. Now, okay. There's a couple of things that might be able to happen. One, they might be able to apply for a disabled player exception, which is what they tried and failed to get for Mitch, uh, which they applied for one for Mitch's spot, which uh, because of how much he makes or whatever would have given them like an $8 million uh, bit of salary chunk to play with, which they could either absorb a player into or uh, just sign a player outright with, which it was probably more likely that they would just use it like a big trade exception and just you know absorb someone directly into that space they could potentially do that with randall i think that it maxes out so like the way it works is it's normally like the uh lesser of 50 percent of the player's salary or i believe the full mid-level exception which is like 12 million dollars right now um and it, if so in randall's case that would mean that if the knicks applied for and got a disabled player exception for randall if he's ruled out mm -hmm. for the year they could potentially get like a $12 million salary. Chunk. It would be 12.4 12. million. Man, I nailed it. And it's a good thing. Mm. Good you, thing. You're good. You're good. I was going to correct you. I was like, wow, he was on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if they were able to apply for and receive that, that opens the door a lot more for certain guys around the league. Uh, because the big problem is that if they're still going to go after like a Malcolm Brogdon type or something like that, which has clearly been the plan. Like they've been shopping around, they've been checking in with Utah, they've been checking in with Portland, you know, trying to find someone to, uh, you know, get to fill that like Emmanuel quickly hole in the second unit of the creation and the, you know, the shot making and all that stuff. It, then you're using your biggest salary chunk that you can afford to use and Evan Fournier for that. And then you don't have much left over to go after someone to replace Randall now. So, that would be pretty much key for them. Like if this comes up and it's like now Randall tore his labrum or something, he's for sure getting surgery. He will for sure be out for the rest of the year. Then they could possibly apply for this exception and get it. And, you know, potentially bring in someone more in that price range, who that guy would be is the bigger question. And I, again, I'm trying to look over rosters and like see who even stands out, but that it's, it's really challenging like to find someone who even fits into that salary slot. Can you, I, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, so sorry to put you on the spot, but can you aggregate the disabled player exception with salary or I no? Do, it, I it do just, not it, think so. Okay. I, I don't because think you're we allowed were, to. Right. I think that it's even more restrictive than a trade exception in that regard, if I'm not mistaken, where like you have to be able to just like take a player into it in full with no yeah. no additional help. Like, and I don't even think you're allowed to have it be like the 120% rule or anything like that. So you can't have someone that makes like $13 million right. in that spot. That yeah, that that's where it kills you for me because we were we you, you threw out PJ Washington and that was a name. I really like to, but to your point, like obviously is not nearly the passer, not nearly the night to night guy. Randall is, but someone who provides sort of a loose facsimile of what he brings to the table, sort of an inside, outside power forward, maybe even an upgrade um, defensively over Julius Randall, and would and would just kind of keep the team afloat. But he makes fifteen and a half million, so then that is your um, that's your Evan Fournier spot if you're doing that, and then you're not also going out and getting 
Malcolm Brogdon. But again, like I, I guess I, I asked to what end, like, like if the Knicks got PJ Washington, is, is he the difference between winning and losing a first round series? Maybe if you play the Cavaliers again, I definitely think they could beat the Cavs with PJ Washington in their lineup. But does that it's, it is, I think we, we all get caught up in things being championship or bust. And maybe that's a stupid thing to do that, for a franchise that was with the exception of one great season was in purgatory for about 20 years. But I don't know if it changes my life at the end of the day to like get to the second round and losing four games to the Bucks or losing five games to the Celtics or whatever. Like I, I don't know if that moves me. I don't know how much it moves the Knicks. I think the issue here is like, we, we saw what Jalen Brunson just did to Miami. We see what he continues to do on a night to night basis. And it just feels like he's climbing up the rungs. And all of a sudden, if you have a guy that you can make a pretty solid case is a top 15 or so player in the entire league, like there is a sense of obligation, even if he's what is 27 years old this year, 26 years old this year, there's like a sense of you never want to waste a year with that guy. So that's, that's where I get caught up in my tendency to lean towards just not doing much. So, all right, let me throw two scenarios at you that I sure. just came up with, spur of the moment. I did remember one other thing about the disabled player exception that I looked mm-hmm. up when uh, when they were applying for it for Mitch. The mm-hmm. only other stipulation with this is that if you receive a player in to fill that spot, that player has to be on an expiring contract. So that's the only other thing that's, that's part of this. There are two teams that the Knicks could potentially look to deal with for that secondary, uh, or I guess it would have been tertiary guy off the bench uh, that – possibly have deals that could work with this if the Knicks were to get this. So I'm just going to throw it out there before we get all the Randall news, whatever, and maybe we could dive deeper on these later on. But Mm -hmm. I just want to put these, put these out into the ether. Utah jazz. There's been rumors of the Knicks potentially going after Jordan Clarkson. Uh, Granted the, the package that Danny Ainge apparently wants is, is a lot because he's Danny Ainge and that's what he does. Uh, But Clarkson could be traded for Fournier in one deal. And if you wanted to structure it as two separate deals, Kelly Olenek is on a expiring $12.1 million deal and would extremely neatly fit into that disabled player exception hole that the Knicks would potentially be able to get uh, for Julius Randle if he is indeed going to be out for the season. So if you convince the Jazz to be like, hey, fine, we'll give you the two picks you want or whatever, but we want Olenek back too. I think that might be a worthy investment and just see like, Hey, he's having a pretty good year. He's no Julius Randall, obviously, but like could at least plug the hole well enough that you go, Hey, maybe if you squint hard enough, this team could actually still make some noise this year and still be set up with a good player in Clarkson next year for when Randall gets back and all that good stuff. Uh, The other one, this one involves a familiar face. Uh, So if, if the Knicks decide this is a little bit of an off the wall option, but from the scoring perspective, you would certainly give it to you defense. You would take a huge step back. Uh, But Bojan Bogdanovic on the Pistons, uh, that Bogdanovic has a $20 million contract this year, gets paid 19 million next year. And it's non-guaranteed, which I assume is in the hands of the Knicks to decide if they wanted to pick him up for next year or not, which they probably would. Uh, so he could be traded for Fournier. And then in a separate deal, Alec Burks is on the last year of his contract, making ten and a half million dollars and could fit into a disabled player exception as well. That is, if the Pistons are not doing what they're rumored to be doing right now and trying to get Zach Levine for some reason uh, and I guess <laughs> contend this year. I don't know what their plan is, uh, but if they are willing to entertain the idea of selling uh, and and selling off on Bogdanovich and on Burks in one deal, that's a deal where I would say, hey, that's especially like Bogdanovich. I think his value has gone down. He's obviously not. He's obviously like kind of a liability on defense now, but still a very talented offensive player that mm-hmm. could just kind of fit right in. And the Knicks have such a solid defensive foundation that if any team could make up for putting a minus defender out there in Randall's spot, I mean, Randall himself is sometimes a minus defender some nights and they work out just fine. Maybe worth giving a shot. I don't know. That's, that's just two deals that just came to my head, but certainly if the news comes down and it looks like Randall is out for the year, we're going to do a whole show on this at some point. It's really funny because if you get Bogdanovich, you're basically building an elevated version of the 2018 
Cavs and you're just saying, hey, Jalen Brunson, go be LeBron in the sense that the spacing would just be so optimal, like bereft of having a stretch five, replacing Randall with an elite high volume three point shooter who also is a pump and drive game. I'm pretty intrigued by that one. When you when you mentioned the jazz, I thought you were going to say John Collins. Obviously, that would that would take the Evan Fournier salary slot, but he's sort of gotten inconsistent minutes there. And offensively, he brings like 80 percent of the stuff Julius Randle does to the table and probably a slightly better defender. So he's a good one year name. The issue with him is just there's really no way him and Randall are coexisting. So you, you have to trade him um, after this year if you do that. But or maybe you trade Julius if, if he plays really well. Well, that's that's a terrible thing to say after he just got her. OK, on that horrible note, uh, let's uh, step aside one more time. When we return, we were actually going to recap what was a really fun game until the last Four minutes. Uh, so that next on Locked on Knicks. Oh, that's cool. This episode of Locked on Knicks is brought to you by Quiz with three eyes. Make sure you get that right. Q-U-I-I-I-Z. Today, we're going to have some fun and test your Knicks knowledge. So we got a, a trivia question here for you guys. Let's see how quick you can do this listening to this podcast. So the question that we've got here is which player in Knicks history holds the record for most points scored in a single game for the Knicks is that Charles Oakley, Patrick Ewing, Walt Frazier, or Carmelo Anthony. And if you got Carmelo Anthony, then you were correct. And if you got that real fast, you probably would have scored pretty well on quiz. So quiz with three eyes is the next generation trivia experience. It's also the world's first platform. We can earn money playing knowledge games. And for locked on Knicks fans, they've created NBA quiz games where you can test your knowledge and win real cash. So play with friends or other fans and let your knowledge shine all the way to the bank. You can play without downloading anything. Just go to app.com. Quiz with again three eyes, Q U I I Z dot com, and start playing today. NBA Quiz is the ultimate knowledge challenge for fans that live and breathe basketball. So go to app.quiz.com to test your knowledge and win cash today. That's quiz with three eyes, just like a three pointer. Play now, showcase your skills, and take home cash prizes. App.quiz.com, where fans become champions. All right, Gavin, we're back in, and let's talk about the positives of this game since we've gone through all of the negatives related to Julius Randle, uh, you know, getting injured and stuff. It was no fun. But the Knicks, I thought, played a really dominant second half again in this game. You know, they sort of went tit for tat with Miami in the first half. I thought there was just some some good shot making on both sides. I thought that, the you know, the Knicks took a while to kind of get going. Like, it was like... They were like uh, trying to start the lawnmower with the ripcord and it took a few yeah. tries. But once they got going, I mean, it, especially when the bench unit came in, they really injected this team with some offense. Josh Hart, I think, had one of his best games maybe of the whole season so far. Uh, it was a team high plus 30 in how many minutes? 32 minutes plus 30. Uh, absolutely OG on Anobi like numbers for him with 14 points, nine boards, five assists. Uh, I thought that he was the spark plug that this team needed. Uh, for much of the game, and it was kind of ironic because he was one of the bigger problem areas against the Heat last year in the playoffs, and yet in this game gave the Knicks everything that they needed to beat this Heat team, which was basically they just need to play with better pace and stop just trying to set up in the half court, get out and run a little bit, you know, try to catch the Heat on their heels, and then they did that and just continued to play phenomenal defense. Eventually, they pull away big in the second half, uh, and you know, the rest is kind of history. There was a, a lot of OG Ananobi, a lot of Jalen Brunson again on a national stage, making his case to be an all-star and probably should have been a starter. Uh, but Gavin, I'll let you pick where to where to start with all that. Yeah, I, I think I got to start with Jalen Brunson because he picked right off where he left off and picked right up where he left off in, in last season's playoffs. And he toyed with Miami. And you you heard, I, I recently rewatched the clip of Eric Spolstra after game six and he was saying like you you guys you guys didn't think that guy was an all-star you guys didn't think that guy was all nba like he he's incredible like i threw everything i could at him and i couldn't i couldn't stop him while well, he dropped like 37 on us in a, in a season deciding game and was one shot away from bringing it home to a game seven in madison square garden you go trust me go go look at the stats of that series go look at what everyone else on the Knicks shot he he was 
a one man army against the Miami Heat, and he almost, 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 almost pulled it off. Um, and, and the difference was he played pretty much exactly the same in this game, Alex, but he had a whole lot of help. Um, but he was just a maestro, and like when his points came, felt significant. Like even early, like to, to your point, when the Knicks start off three for 15, he hit a three to end a 9 0 run, and then just seeing. I, I know I, I I probably say this phrase every recap, but just just like his footwork package, like absolutely freezing Jimmy Butler on a Euro, um, like a rip through spin into like a one handed and one hook. That was nasty. At one point, he basically drew like a quintuple team and set up Quentin Grimes for a wide open three, had back to back plays during that 16 to three run that started. Uh, we should note with Julius Randle hitting a buzzer beating three to end the third quarter. Um, he had back to back like half spin reverse pivot fadeaways on on big defenders um, runner into a pull up three that made it one twelve ninety six. I just wrote down in my notes all caps goodbye heat he uh, I can't I can't say the full word because this is a family podcast but he he big deed the Miami Heat Alex he was he was incredible in this game and I thought it was like an fu tone for this entire team like I'll, I'll let you continue off on this I don't know what Tibbs said to the bench before they came in or before this game, but I have never or rarely seen Josh Hart. And I think never seen Quentin Grimes play with the kind of aggression in the half court offensively. And obviously that Hart dunk was, was sort of the cherry on top of all of it, but the way like Grimes, like we've been begging for him all year, attacked the rim over and over and over, just unrelenting, like had chances to take threes and instead just got to the rim again and again and again. I mean, that was, it, it, it was epic. Like I, I could not have had more fun watching this game until the injury. Yeah, for real. I mean, I thought the bench unit to your point was really, really good. Like I loved what I saw out of, I, I think the lineup, that we were we've kind of been worried about just kind of keeps getting better and better mm -hmm. honestly like the the way yeah. that their their symbiosis is working like just the way that they're learning how to play off each other's cuts and like what each other's strengths are to the nth degree like the lineup of deuce mcbride quentin grimes josh hart og ananobi and Presh sachua like killed it when they were out there for a little bit in the first half and then a little bit in the second half as well like the movement was fantastic. Deuce was hitting threes in the corner. Like OG, this was when Brunson was still in the game, but like the bench had started to filter in. But like OG just like got it on the perimeter and pump faked Jaime Hakez like out of his shoes and then gets by him and then pulls a Euro in the lane. I was like, oh, all right. Like we don't really see that out of OG. It's usually just like drive, straight line drive, get in there, mm -hmm. like go for a dunk or something because he's like, a, a super athlete and instead he comes in and, and like hits a euro and like a nice kind of like touch layup that was also powerful at the same time like love seeing that um precious i thought was really good i mean other than the obvious like touch concerns on offense like he still is a little frustrating in that regard but like getting the rebounds and just playing solid defense like isaiah hartenstein came back in this game and only played 16 minutes and I'm glad that that was probably partially like load management now for that. Uh, we've officially gotten well, <laughs> while we're on medical diagnoses uh, during this episode, we've sort of officially finally gotten word that it's Achilles tendonitis that he has, mm -hmm. um, which is just sort of a, a rest injury. Like you kind of just have, to, it's from overexertion, uh, you know, and, and adding too much strain to a tendon and then it can lead to, you know, sprains or tears or other things down the line if you don't treat it properly. So it was good to see him get less minutes. And the fact that Precious is still playing as well as he is right now, that he was able to play the 30 minutes and Hartenstein could kind of just like get his feet wet again was super refreshing. Uh, and, I'm, you know, the rebounding is exactly what the Knicks always need out of their center that you're getting out of Precious right now. And it's fantastic. Um, and then Grimes, too. I mean, to your point, great second half, especially. I mean, I wish the Knicks could just tell Grimes that every single quarter of every game was a fourth quarter against the Miami Heat. He'd yeah. be unstoppable. Like, this is like the team that he loves to play. And he just came out in the fourth quarter, especially, and just like torched them uh, and made some really backbreaking shots, made a really big three to kind of start putting things away, start, you know, kind of dusting the hands off and getting ready to go home, you know. Um, it was it was a great game from him. Great game, just like all across the board, man. Like it's so hard to even just pick one player, but they all it was a, it was the epitome of like a full team win, even if Brunson 
was the the ultimate star of the whole thing. Yeah, I it maybe won't be this year now, depending on what happens, Randall. But don't don't you just get the feeling before this era of Knicks basketball is done and this era of Heat basketball is done, we're going to get one more playoff series between the two of them. Like I, I don't it just it just it feels like destiny to me. And that being said, I thought uh, I'm going to comment it, even though it's like the fifth time I'm saying this podcast, like Harden Grimes just set a tone that, all right, if you have Duncan Robinson out there and you have Tyler Hero out there and you try to get cute and, and play both of them at the same time or, or even one of them when either of those two guys are on the floor, like we're coming for him and we're, we're going at him over and over and over again. And that was um, like, if you remember in last year's playoffs, that was all I could focus. I'm like, I wish Grimes could go at Duncan. I wish Grimes could go at Duncan. And, and he didn't. And I was coming into this year. I was like, all right, he better have an off the dribble game. He better have an off the dribble. And we, we didn't see it the whole year. And and what I liked about this is like it wasn't anything fancy from him. Like it was it was mostly just straight line drives. Like when they got slightly off balance on a closeout, um, and how replicable that is game to game. Like it's on Grimes to keep showing it. And I think honestly, like he can if he continues to do this, Alex, he can make a pretty compelling case for the Knicks to keep him. Um, but that was that was a message. Like what OG Ananobi did. Even like Jaime Hawkins got a great block on him at one point. OG said, "All right, bet," and like kept going at him and like twice on step backs got about. Five feet of separation on Hawkes, who's a pretty good young defender. Um, so that was awesome. Dante DiVincenzo made some quick, sh- some great shots, and I just want to, um, I want to shout out um, Julius one more time. Like I thought his his passing was really good. The third quarter buzzer beater was great. Um, he beat Jimmy Butler one time on just like a straight line drive. That was really cool. Um, and then Precious Achua's defense was great. Like, got got a strip on Jimmy Butler one time. Like, that shows up over and over again. Um, when you watch these games, like, and he gets someone switched on him that should probably torch him, and he, he finds a way to get a steal. Um, I, I think he's he's clicking in a way that I just didn't see when the Knicks first got him. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap it up on that. But um, an incredible game, and um, just hoping for the best uh, with Julius because this, this is starting to feel like similar to twelve thirteen, but just more sustainable like like we're on the brink of something really great here and hopefully it's not it's not over before it really gets rolling yeah i hope so too uh but we'll end this somewhat depressing episode uh by saying hey at least there's a lot of knicks basketball coming up this week to sort of distract us even if there will be a uh, a a large julius shaped hole in that starting lineup that will be sorely missed but the knicks with a back-to-back to start the week so hornets Uh, on the road to take on the Hornets, then back home to take on the Jazz on Tuesday, then big showdown with the Pacers on Thursday. So it'll be a busy week of Knicks action. I'm sure there's still going to be a lot of uh, Knicks trade buzz and things of that nature too, although maybe it'll calm down or maybe it'll uh, ramp up. Who knows? And hopefully we'll get an update on Julius Randle. Whenever that does happen, we will certainly have you guys covered. But until next time, thank you all for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Peace out, everybody.